I'm extremely relieved because I passed the first test, which was not to trip on the steps coming up. I'm a bit nervous, I have to admit. It's nice to see you all. Good morning. I tried to coax Jasmine into taking the second presentation today too, but she, she refused. So a uh, few people ask me why I'm presenting and what I'm presenting about, and I say the Baha'i world in 30 minutes. But it's not the Baha'i world as, uh, you know, it's, it's a smaller version of the Baha'i world, so. Um, can we get the slides up? Thank you. One hundred years ago, uh, in February of 1924, Shoghi Effendi received a correspondence from Horace Hawley, who would be for decades the National Secretary of the Assembly in the United States and eventually appointed as Hand of the Cause of God. <clears throat> Mr. Hawley proposed to Shoghi Effendi an idea. It was a pitch for a, a book, a, an annual publication which could bring together in one place all the activities, the varied activities of this young emerging community. Uh, something that could be presented to an intelligent, wider public. And could, it's quite a remarkable vision actually, could trace the emergence of a, of a new revelation as it materialized into, into physical and social reality. And uh, Shoghi Effendi, at the time, 27 years old, three years into his guardianship, he embraced this idea enthusiastically. He put his whole weight behind it. He immediately wanted to mobilize the funds, the meager funds of the faith at the time, to ensure that financially this project would be supported and would be successful. And beyond that, Shoghi Effendi gave to this project his brilliant mind and his editorial hand, which I want to reflect on with you afterward. What, what happened in that correspondence was the birth of a new idea. It was, it was uh, what we now call the emergence of the Baha'i world volumes. Uh, and I'm sure that many of you are familiar with the volumes. I hope at least some of you are familiar with them. I'll be able to talk to you a little bit about them today. Um, you know, the, the volumes, these sort of iconic tomes that were published from 1926 to, to 1992 as a multi-year volume. And then later on, a second series was an annual volume that was published from 92 to, to 2006. These line the, the bookshelves of the holy places. When you go to the mansion of Bachi or to the Haifa Pilgrim House, there are these beautiful books that have been gathered. And also you find them in national libraries, you know, national Baha'i centers local centers, university libraries. Um, and so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about these works. I think that we're in a point in history where we can look back at the brilliant vision of the Guardian and think about what was, what was achieved and what he was trying to achieve through the publication of these works. And then I hope to share with you a little bit about the evolution of the Baha'i world, uh, what it is becoming, what its future will be, uh, again, the Baha'i world. Um, we heard about the, the Baha'i world in much more profound sense over the last couple of days. Um, and, uh, and really, one of the, one of the aims of this uh, presentation is that uh, I want to connect the next generation with the Baha'i world. This is, a, this is a publication that is under the supervision of the House of Justice. And, uh, and it's, it's a gift to us to nourish the intellectual life of the Baha'i community. And it's one piece, one of the many ways in which the House of Justice is providing us resources to enrich our understanding of the revelation and its implications for this day. And it, uh, it really is something that we hope in the coming years will help nourish our our contributions to the discourses of society. I have to figure out how to use this thing, okay. Before going into the Baha'i world in greater depth, it's nice to contextualize it a little bit. 
as we've seen in the past two days, the, the, the night plenary sessions especially, and, and even a you know, cursory study of the writings, it's obvious Baha'is are to be highly conscious of time. We operate in, in a hyper-conscious way in the context of time. As a global community, we, we take our steps according to plans that are between one and several years long. Those plans fit within series of plans, quarter century. And those series of plans fit within ages. We are in epochs and ages, so we are now in the formative age, just having completed the first hundred years. And this formative age falls within at least a thousand year dispensation, which is itself embedded in a half a million year cycle. So I don't think it's a stretch to say that when we think of the oneness of humankind and you think about how Baha'u'llah elevates our consciousness, it's not just across geographic space, it's also across time. We are one human race tracing back to the very origins of our species and we are connected to those who will come after us. So you think how remarkable it is that this revelation asks of even the most little of us to see ourselves in this profound connection with, with our fellow human beings across time and space. And the Baha'i world uh, volumes were initiated at the very beginning of the formative age, just a few years into the initiation of the formative age. So you have what would become a record of the unfoldment of the first century of the formative age in these wonderful documents. It, it would take only two years after that initial correspondence between Horace Holly and Shoghi Effendi for the first volume to be published. It was under the name Baha'i Yearbook. And if you have a chance to find it, look at it, it's a, it's a really wonderful volume. It's the shortest of the bunch. It's, it's less than 200 pages long. And there's something really touching about the opening. The, 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 the editors are extremely uh, transparent about what they're trying to achieve in their, in their opening introduction. And, um, <clears throat> and what they do is, you know, this, these volumes were written to reach the wider public and make it available of the, to this emerging new faith that was being documented, its, its rise and its spread was being documented. They invited the, the sympathizers with the ideals of the faith to especially focus on part four of this short volume. And you can see many of the themes that were being explored. These were the principles that Abdu'l-Bahá had, had brought to the West. Many of them were still grappling with, all of which we're still grappling with today, except for maybe Esperanto, you know. <laughs> the relationship between science and religion, the equality, the, really the implications of, of a world in which men and women are, are equal partners. Race, which we talked about, which we heard about last night, how to bring about the end to racial prejudice. And many other topics, the oneness of humankind, world peace, these would become the subjects of, of the exploration of Baha'i thought for the century, and I'm sure will continue for, for decades and centuries to come. The editors also faced certain questions that we continue to face today. How does a religious community, especially in the West, where maybe religion is largely dismissed as a, as a serious contributor to the advancement of thought, how does a religious community like ours contribute constructively to the progress of the whole? And how can we be taken seriously? How do we contribute in such a way that our contributions are regarded as relevant, timely, compelling, and applicable to the problems that humanity faces? How do we write from a global perspective? This may be the first time in history that we're trying to write the history of the whole human race from one perspective, not from the perspective of one group that's conquered another group or one group that has the resources to, to, to drive the narrative, but really trying to find 
the voice of humanity as one people. These were the things that the editors were grappling with and would become the subject of exploration for de the following decades. And finally, and we'll touch on this later, how do we navigate the tension between both the, the unlimited confidence that we have in the revelation of Baha'u'llah, but our own obvious limitations in our understanding of that revelation and our ability to apply it to the world? Two years after the, the, vol the first volume was published, af right after the second volume, The Guardian wrote to the Baha'is of the East and the West, sharing his admiration for the Baha'i world volumes and, and really his vision for what, what these volumes were trying to achieve. And I thought I would share with you a little bit some excerpts from that letter, which is a really remarkable letter and captures his vision that would unfold over the decades that followed. The Guardian described the Baha'i World Volumes as a unique record of worldwide Baha'i activity that attempts to present to the general public, as well as to the student and scholar, those historical facts and fundamental principles that constitute the distinguishing features of the message of Baha'u'llah to this age. He goes on to say, I confidently and emphatically recommend to every thoughtful and eager follower of the faith whether in the East or in the West, whose desire is to place in the hands of the critical and intelligent inquirer, this is our audience, the critical and intelligent inquirer of whatever class, creed, or color, a work that can truly witness to the high purpose, the moving history, the enduring achievements, the resistless march, and infinite prospects of the revelation of Baha'u'llah. It stands unexcelled and unapproached by any publication of its kind in the varied literature of our beloved cause. If you haven't had a chance to run your fingers through these volumes, they're quite remarkable. It is like a window into the, Baha the development of the Baha'i community from, from, from decade to decade. Each volume is Is a, is a visual and textual exploration of what happened over a period of time. Initially, biennials, meaning every two years they were published, and for a time, four years. These ran through the Second World War, through the Cold War, when our resources were slim, when our resources were more plentiful. But when you flip through these pages, you see the Baha'i community. You see what it is, what it was trying to achieve. You see it spread and grow. You can see not only through, t through documents and photos, but The Guardian would put like facsimiles of legal documents, marriages that, you know, marriage certificates that were approved in a particular society. Or so you really like from, eight, from, from volume to volume, you could see how the faith was marching along certain tremendous advancements, certain struggles and challenges over the, over the decades of the 20th century. First national conventions in society after society, social action projects across the world, a community beginning to flourish. You had these artifacts like maps and facsimiles you know, of, of letters and postcards from Queen Marie to Shoghi Effendi. Uh, you know, these wonderful gifts, the calligraphy of Mishkin Galam. This was before the, house of, the seat of the house of worship was, was built. You know, a picture that would animate the imagination of the friends looking forward to the final inauguration of the seat. By the end of the 20th century, the last decade, having traced these Wonderful, this wonderful advancement of the cause over the early decades of the formative age, we arrived kind of at a new stage as a Baha'i community. By the 90s, a number of things had come together and we were sort of in a very confident position as a Baha'i, as a Baha'i world. Um, and just to name a few things that happened during that time that, and, and the relevance of it is that we, a new series of Baha'i worlds were, were 
published. But I just wanted to share a few things that were happening at that time. Mr. Lample alluded to, at the end of the 20th century, humanity had a certain confidence that we were actually heading towards a peaceful world. And we as a Baha'i community felt that, that, that hope and optimism as well. And we were seeing it in the masses of humanity. The faith had grown tremendously over the decades that preceded 1990. By 1992, we were recognized as the second most widespread religion in the world. We had our Baha'i, second Baha'i World Congress, 30,000 people descended on New York. You could see the diversity and the flourishing of this community. We had social and economic development projects spreading out across the planet. We had relationships with agencies of the United Nations for decades, and we had reached consultative status among some of them. We had offices at the, at the of the Baha'i National Community at the United Nations. Of course, 1979, with the, with the overthrow of the, the current Iranian regime and the establishment of the Islamic uh, Republic in Iran, we also saw the, the persecution of the Baha'is. And as tragic and devastating, devastating as that was, it raised the, the, the faith in, in the public consciousness. The faith became recognized it was coming out of obscurity. And in response to all these changes that were happening, in 1985, the House of Justice started the, established the Office of Public Information, which was an office really established to respond to the growing interest from the wider world in this, in this faith, in this movement that had, had transformed and grown so rapidly. So the Baha'i world in 1992 became an actual yearbook. For the, from 1992 to 2006, it was a publication under the Office of Public Information. And its orientation became public information. It was short, pithy articles written for journalists. It was written in a journalistic style. It was really meant to reach a wider audience of, of people who were asking questions about the faith and wanted to know what is this movement that's become so prominent in the last few decades. But as we all know, by 2006, everything was moving online. We had now a number of international websites for the faith. National communities were establishing websites. We had a number of publications. The Baha'i world was flourishing online and in, and in the literary world. And the question of what would happen with the Baha'i world, now that so many of the things it was trying to achieve previously were being done by other pro Baha'i properties, it was unknown what would happen with, with the Baha'i world. And it went on a hiatus for some years. This happened at a time when, as we heard over the last two evenings, the Baha'i community was going through a profound transformation, trying to discover how it could respond to the great receptivity that it saw in the world, and how it could begin to consolidate that receptivity and channel it into, into the betterment of the world. So we were in 2006 when they stopped publishing the Baha'i world. We were really in, a, in, in the beginning of learning how to walk after all the basic elements of these series of plans had been put into place. And by 2010, with the Rezvan message, the House of Justice felt that the Baha'i world was ready to take what it was learning in the field of expansion and consolidation and translate that systematic learning process into its efforts in social action and participation in the discourse of society. Between 2010 and 2020, the, the work of the Baha'i international community and a growing number of external affairs offices and national assemblies became oriented around learning about participation in the discourses of society. And it was a, it was a very generative period. It was a very eye-opening period, not only in the sense of the receptivity that we saw with the ideas that we were offering as a Baha'i community, but also to our methods and approaches. The Baha'is were, the, were, were learning to open spaces that were truly consultative. And they were, there was a certain gravitational pull to our efforts that was, that was attracting actor, very prominent actors at the international and national levels. So that the 2010s were a time when we began to really learn systematically, although we've been participating in discourses from the beginning, it was a time when we began to really see the Baha'i community 
advance in a systematic way. And by the end of that period, the House of Justice wrote to all national assemblies the following, which I'll share. Just want to read excerpts from a message from the House of Justice to through the Department of the Secretariat. That message reads, the House of Justice feels that there is a value in collecting in one location a selection of thoughtful essays, as well as substantial articles and features on a range of subjects that would be of interest to the wider public. It has therefore decided that it is timely to establish the Baha'i world as a website and envisions that the site which is located at baha'iworld.baha'i.org, will gradually be augmented with content that conveys advances at the levels of thought and action and reflects the faith's purpose and mission in the world. And so you remember the fourth part of the very first volume, which was addressing the sympathizers with the ideals of the faith. This is what the website sought to do in the context of what we had learned in terms of participation in the discourses of society. So in 2019, a very basic website was established with seven articles, five new articles, touching on topics like technology and peace. And there was an article on houses of worship. Wonderful articles that started this process of, of, of the website. And the website evolved um, and began to become a repository not only for the, the far reaches of Baha'i thought on the, on the themes most relevant to humanity at this time, but also began to include a library of articles from the old volumes. Over the subsequent years, 27 articles were published that were new, and another 70 or so articles from the old volumes have been put up that will continue. Um, and what you could begin to see in these articles is not only where our thinking is going, but also, you could see the continuity of our thought and the evolution of our thought by looking at articles on race, for example, from the early 1930s to an article on race in 2022. How has our thinking advanced on this subject? How has our experience advanced over a century? So it's a, it's a wonderful repository of current and past Baha'i thought. That letter of the House of Justice to the all national assemblies also ended by planting the thought that there might be a physical volume or that the physical volumes might continue. And I thought I would share that also with you. The House of Justice wrote, in due course, consideration will also be given to the release of volumes of the Baha'i world in book form. And shortly after that message, I think the House of Justice really felt that looking back at the early, I can't speak on behalf of the House of Justice, but I'll just say that I think the thinking uh, was that, and certainly on the editorial board, that, that looking back at the early volumes and looking at the history of the Baha'i world, that, that a hard copy, a book, a physical book, says something about the permanence seriousness and perspective of the Baha'i community that just can't be done with a website. So plans were put in place for a new series of volumes to come. And I'm, I'm very happy to announce to you that in the next few months, the next volume of the Baha'i World, volume 35, will be made available. I want to spend the last bit of time that I have, I hope I haven't gone over, talking about the volume a bit and, and giving you a little bit of a glimpse of what it will be. Um, and it's, you know, it's been a long time in the works. A lot is happening in the world right now. And that's disrupted a lot of the publication process. But I'm hopeful that in the next couple months, we'll have it in hand. Um, just to say a little bit about the thinking about the volume before I go through it a bit. One of the questions that arose when, when the volume was being conceived is, how do we speak to the world now? 
in light of all the experience we've had over the last century? I mean, how has our understanding of ourselves as a community and of our mission changed, matured over time? And how do we speak to others about that? And as Mr. Lample said last night, is this, not, is this experience of the Baha'i community not actually part of the legacy of the human race? Aren't we the human race? Aren't we the human family that's on this path of learning? Isn't this something that belongs to everyone? It is the story of the human race as one family. It's the beginning of that story. And we're trying to tell it from our perspective. We're in the stretch from our collective adolescence to our collective maturity. We're trying to document that journey as a Baha'i community. We're one of many human groups that are trying to construct a better world. We're not the only ones. How do we write recognizing that there are many, many other human in individuals, groups, organizations that are sacrificing, giving their all to try to bring about a better world? We're one among them. And yet we also have a special mission. How do we reconcile these two things? How do we navigate these two realities and convey them to others? And if, in fact, we as a Baha'i community, because we do have something quite unique, aside from the revelation, everyone knows the revelation is unique, but we as a community, where else in the world can you say that there's been a group of people for many generations now, applying the principle of the equality of women and men, not only family to family to family for eight generations or nine generations, I don't know how, I might be overstretching a bit, but, but also across every kind of social, cultural reality you can imagine. The body of experience that we have over time and over geographic space is unique. And we have yet to really mine it. I mean, we have, we have a lot of work cut out ahead of us to bring out the insights that such a rich experience brings. This is something unique. I would argue is unique. And if we do have this special thing, and of course, we're not just talking about the revelation, but the community of mortal human beings, of flawed, you know, imperfect human beings that are trying to bring into life, into reality, this glorious revelation. How do we convey this to others? How do we become part of a bigger conversation about change in the world and bring the insights from the teachings and from our experience, not in a promotional effort, but playing our part in humanity's efforts to tackle its most intractable ills? I want to share with you the introduction of the book, because I think it gives you something of the sense of what the book is and what it's trying to achieve. This volume of the Baha'i world represents an invitation. It is an invitation to survey the planet through the experience of a community inspired by the vision and teachings of Baha'u'llah. This global community is composed of people from all walks of life who are striving and learning to effect constructive, lasting change. Numbering in the millions and animated by love for their fellow human beings, an abiding faith in the capacity of all to contribute to progress, they are purposefully laying the foundations of a new world. In the pages that follow can be found glimpses of emerging patterns of thought and action, of an evolving educational approach, of an unfolding administrative system, and of a recasting of relationships among individuals, communities, and institutions, each rooted in the conviction that humanity is one. We trust that this volume will capture something of the progress made over 15 years, and that it will offer hope and insight to every reader who aspires toward the betterment of the world and arises to serve its peoples. Of course, the change that we're seeking comes from the Word of God. And the book starts with a meditation on the Word of God. 
It has a series of beautiful photographs taken from sites associated with the faith and passages from the Baha'i writings from Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l Baha on subjects like tr transformation and civilization to lift the vision of the reader, to give them a sense of how glorious this revelation is and what it calls all of humanity to strive for. In addition to the articles, the Baha'i World volume brings together artwork from around the Baha'i world as a, as, a, as a means of visual communication. Every part of the book opens with either a textile or a painting from a Baha'i artist. It really aspires to be beautiful, and it's something that we hope can be distributed to, to your colleagues, to your you know, to people that are thinking about the world. And, you know, this is supposed to be a sort of a, a, the embodiment of, of beauty and excellence, the best that we can offer. Now, the heart of the book is an exploration of what happened over the last quarter century. And we're trying to tell that story from a bird's eye view. What happened, it's not just about four core activities, what actually happened over 25 years? How did this community transform? What did it set out to achieve? What did it achieve? And how does that fit within a broader context? As the old volumes did, there are little gems in this volume, details and information that are just not publicly available anywhere else. For example, information about the houses of worship, including their costs, that, that we're, we're the, only place in, what, the only place to find those details in the past for, for researchers was often in the Baha'i World volumes. These are being made available again in the new volume. Of course, the story isn't just told through words, but also through images. There are a number of what we call photo essays that take you through developments at the Baha'i World Center with houses of worship, it was an extremely generative period in Baha'i history. There are wonderful articles on the implementation of the Badi calendar. There's a survey of what's happened over the last 30 years with respect to the advancement of women. Images convey a story of a community that's diverse and yet one united through a common thread. A number of, as you all know, a number of anniversaries occurred during this time frame and there, there are a series of articles that look at those. And then, as we talked about with discourse, the, uh, the Baha'i world highlights examples of the way the Baha'i community is, is contributing to the discourses of society. At the international level, there are a few publications of the Baha'i international community that are included. There are a couple of uh, statements from Baha'i communities to their national societies in Egypt and in Colombia during historic moments in those countries. And then, of course, drawing from the website there are some a sampling of articles that are touching on themes relevant to humanity's uh, betterment, sort of what we call discourse themes. There's an in memoriam section, which is one of the, my favorite sections, looking through the old volumes. And, um, and so now I'll wrap up. Thank you for your patience. Um, volume 35 aspires to a level of accessibility and relevance that we hope will resonate with any soul eager to find new models of social organization and will offer hope to humanity that perhaps one day we can find our way through this, as Luke called it, wasteland towards a future in which we live in, live in peace and harmony. The audience of the book, of course, is really those people who are connected somehow to the faith, are following our endeavors, are participating in our endeavors, are, are keenly interested in the affairs of humanity and eager to learn about a community that's trying to contribute to the transformation of society. In the aggregate, 
it contributes to this unfolding series of books that are telling the coherent story of the emergence of a revelation of Baha'u'llah in the world. And I want to just conclude with a few personal reflections. I'm, by training, an emergency physician. Um, and some of my friends here are also emergency physicians and can probably relate. You don't have to be an emergency physician, though, to know that the world is falling apart. But for emergency physicians, it can be quite, I, I have to say, I mean, day in and day out working in that environment. And I work in a county hospital. And in recent years, especially with a, chi a young child, it is easy to feel despair. I mean, I can see among my colleagues, extraordinary colleagues, people really sacrificing day in and day out to serve humanity. I can see many of them are hopeful, but, but I have also seen many of them become cynical, apathetic, and many of them despairing at the state of things. And, and, and I myself, I, I'm, I'm saddened by the lack of leadership in the world that could allow that, uh, you know, generations of our youth to be saturated with drugs, to have no sense of purpose. The amount of illness, mental illness, physical illness that we see is, is a sign of a, you know, of a decaying society. And, it's, and, it, and in that sense, the work of the Baha'i community is truly a bomb. It's truly a source of hope. It is, I don't think without it, I could have hope. Um, but also in a world of rapidly changing fortunes and short attention spans, it's easy to lose sight of the potentialities of the processes that are at work in the Baha'i world today. It's, it's possible that we could live our whole lives without understanding what we actually have and what we're actually trying to achieve. It's possible to underappreciate the reality that Baha'u'llah has left us the last refuge of a tottering civilization. He's given us the house of justice. <clears throat> and the house of justice is walking with us. It's guiding us. It's giving us our compass through this wasteland. We have an extraordinary experience across the Baha'i world to mine for insights to offer humanity. We have a unique experience. We have a challenge before us to both have the imagination to see in what Baha'is are doing today, the seeds of the solutions humanity is looking for, and in seeing them, to be able to articulate them to others. And not only articulate them, articulate them with the right tone and attitude, with the right posture, both of modesty and humility, and yet unabounding confidence. How does our language and posture reflect our confidence in the revelation of Baha'u'llah, but also our modesty about how much we actually understand about <laughs> that vision and how far we've actually been able to go in applying it. <clears throat> That's one of the questions that I have that I want to raise for us. How do we bring our insights and our teachings and our principles to a suffering world, but not in a triumphalistic way, not in a way that makes it seem like we've got everything and they've got nothing, but in a way that invites them to join us? to learn with us, to walk with us, that values their contributions, that, that is inherently an approach that listens to others as much as we offer to others, invites them to learn with us, to contribute to us, and to do it in a way that's relevant to where humanity is at. It's not tone deaf. It recognizes that much of humanity is suffering much of humanity is lost and wayward. And to do that in a compelling way, in an invitational way. And my last question is, 
aside from our victories and our achievements as a Baha'i community, from which we can draw tremendous lessons, what can we learn from our failures? What can we learn from our clumsiness and our stumbling that we can share with others? Because despite the difficulty of going through change, and the last 25 years were very difficult, I've seen my friends, my, you know, the, the youth that I grew up with respond to the plan in very different ways. Some have maybe felt disenfranchised. This is not the faith they knew when they grew up or whatever you may have heard. But despite all of that, we have all stayed together. At the end of 25 year period, we are one community and we're marching forward and I've never seen so much confidence in the communities I've seen now. And the receptivity in the world around us is unprecedented. So despite the challenges we face, and we will continue to face them as a community, diverse, our experiences are diverse, we are diverse, our opinions vary widely. What can we convey to humanity about how difficult change is, but how possible it is? So this contribution of the Baha'i world is one contribution to humanity's effort to overcome its ills and build a new world. I thank you so much for your time. Thank you.